Bakshat, Surrey, Stock Belt, just off the motorway but outside the dull monotony of suburbia. No more urban density, no terraces or semi-detached houses, but green lanes, large detached houses, well laid out, electronic gates, two to three car garages, large gardens, lawns, flower beds, groves of trees, water features, large walls, to keep strangers out, to keep prying eyes out, big salaries to live here. I cornered her. No trouble. By this, I mean no use of force. Perhaps for her, having no escape route was not a very pleasant feeling. For me, being so close and personal with someone I didn't expect to be so nice was very nice. Her being pushed into a corner was more a result of the geometry of the kitchen. My position very close to her meant that she was sandwiched between the beveled edges of a quartz countertop that ran in two directions from the corner unit. So between those two countertops she was literally cornered, while I was right in front of her, my breasts no more than an inch from her cloth-covered breasts. I was close enough to smell the conditioner she used to keep her jet-black hair so shiny, close enough to see the clean white line of skin in the center of the part as I looked down at her, and enjoyed the view of the deep the valley between her breasts, where neither her summer blouse nor the top of her apron hid her seductive naked body. I was going to enjoy the exposure of those full breasts. She was much cuter than I had imagined, and the revenge sex I had planned would be much sweeter than I had ever dreamed. I was close enough that she could certainly smell my cologne, which I wear lightly on my upper body, rather than my face. Because now that I work outdoors, I don't have to shave anymore and have designer stubble better suited to my new role as a gardener handyman than to my previous life, in offices with floor-to-ceiling glass windows. I've already worked for two hours in the summer sun, so the scent of my cologne is layered with a more natural masculine scent, the earthy scent that inevitably comes with physical labor in the sun. She was petite, and I wasn't. Her cute little nose, which, like her breasts, was also only a few inches from my breasts, must have caught both my cologne and that other earthy scent. In fact, the breasts were several inches closer to me than her nose. I was sure that they were natural and that it was not the bra that made them bulge so much. She was no longer in her teens, closer to thirty, a woman, not a girl. Her display of cleavage showed that she was very comfortable with those breasts. What I needed was behind her, but instead of asking her, I simply reached out leaning forward and placing my hand on her left shoulder. My chest was pressed against the biab of the apron and against the chest directly below it. If I had been wearing my work shirt, if I had not left it on the chair outside, the intimacy of this movement would have been much less. Instead, the tanned, bare skin of my chest, softened by a thick head of black hair, touched her, softly pressing against her breasts, and a muscular, naked hand touched her hair. I moved the bowl labeled sugar to my mug, removed the lid, and put two spoons into my coffee. I drink it sweet. I raised the mug above her head and brought it to my lips. I can drink it hot. It was delicious. That's what I told her. She looked up nervously. I hope everything is okay. Shall I get you some cookies or something else? Any excuse for us to move so I could step back and free her? No, I'm fine. She remained trapped not only by the kitchen corner and my body, but also by her reserve, her inability to assert herself, even to simply invite me to drink coffee outside and enjoy the shade of the patio, not to mention the fact that I should move away instead of invading her personal space. She was excited, embarrassed by my proximity, but could not express it or free herself from being cornered by a naked male torso. Trying to push past me would mean touching naked male flesh, and that was not something she was inclined to do. She hasn't been in the sun. Her complexion was pure white, green eyes paired unusually with black hair, cute nose, full lips. Her figure was feminine, neither lend nor plump, her hips curved beautifully to her calves under a skirt of light Indian cotton that tied at the waist. The arms were not toned but nicely rounded and slender. The legs were probably the same, not toned but slender, but they were hidden by the skirt. You make good coffee, I said, raising the mug to my mouth and taking another sip. Cool, aren't you too hot in your penny? 
I like to choose my words carefully. To call it an apron would leave it as just a question. By calling it a penny, I was gently making fun of it. Nobody needs an apron to make a pot of coffee. The gentle taunt left her speechless for a moment, and I took advantage of that moment by reaching behind her, not for the sugar this time, but for the butterfly bow she was using just behind her neck, under the strands of jet black hair. I found the end and pulled. You can't just... She started. But by then I had set my mug down and pulled her towards me with one hand, creating space between her and the tabletop, and wrapped my other hand around her waist. Another knot, another end, another gentle tug, and I was off with the apron. I placed my hand at the base of her spine and pulled her even closer. She must have felt my hardness inside my gardening shorts, as straight as Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. By then, another woman might have slapped me. Not this woman. She had no idea what to do. She was not used to the directness of the approach I was using, and she did not have answers in her standard repertoire of human interaction. One by one, I unbuttoned the small white buttons of her blouse, starting with the top one. With each button, another inch of sheer white cleavage came into view, then a white bra, faux lace, thin enough to show the pinkness of her areolas. She struggled. It was hardly worth describing it as a struggle. She squirmed slightly, trying to turn away from me, but normal shoveling gave me strength, and all I had to do was strain my arm and she gave in. Looking at me, her green eyes told me that she would not resist anymore. She allowed me to take the blouse off my shoulders and slide it down my arms. I let the blouse fall off her back and instead placed my hand on her warm flesh, my fingers resting on the ladder of her ribcage, pushing up the back strap of her bra. I found the clasp and unfastened it. I pulled the narrow straps down on both sides, down to the middle of her forearms. The cups fell forward, halfway on her chest. As if to help me, she relaxed at her arms, the straps fell under the weight of the bra cups, and she removed her hands from them as the bra stopped between us at the level of my crotch, her waist. Is this what you wanted? She asked. It wasn't a challenge because she wasn't capable of it. It was a defensive, timid, anxious feeling she felt. I ignored the question. She was incredibly naive if she really needed to ask what I wanted. I cupped my chest. I rinsed my hands under the tap and wiped them on my shorts. But they were the hands of a worker, the skin hardened by labor. She gasped. In the hallway, I saw photographs of a happy couple on their wedding day and on vacation together. There were no photographs of children, no crayon drawings in the kitchen. Please, she sobbed. Meaningful communication requires more than just one word. It could be, please stop. Perhaps it was, or perhaps please do it again. It could be, please make it stronger, or please do whatever you want. There was no way to know what she wanted to express with a single word. Her breasts seemed more sensitive than most, and, voluntarily or not, her body was reacting to what could be called a form of male aggression. I like to think of it as male self-confidence. I like to think I'm not sexist. Both men and women can be assertive, some women want assertive men, some men want assertive women. That's how the world works. My self-confidence may or may not have been what she consciously desired in her cozy world of perfect houses and gardens, but I felt that another part of her needed, craved, male dominance over her, and my good deed that day should have provided it to her. There was one more bow that was not undone. At waist level, on the right side, he fastened an Indian cotton belt around the skirt. The long cotton belt was wrapped around her waist once more, but only this simple knot kept the skirt from falling to the floor. I pulled the end. The knot has unraveled. The skirt began to slide down. I stepped back just enough to give her space. The white lace bra, which until that moment had still been lying between our bodies, fell to the floor, and the Indian cotton skirt fell with it in a shapeless heap around her legs. There was not a single inch of fabric covering any part of the body. She stood naked. You know that women who like to be naked under a skirt or dress subconsciously hope that they will be taken, I said. I get uncomfortable in the heat, she said defensively. Waxed or laser? My husband doesn't like hair. So never again? 
Not anymore, she said. Is he attacking you? Sometimes, that's all she was ready to answer me. I'll do this before I have sex with you. I don't think I can stop you. She looked at me with resignation in her eyes. Do you want it? She fell into complete silence. I picked her up. I used both hands at her sides, just under her rib cage, to lift her up and over her left shoulder, her ass next to my head, warm against my ear, defenseless against the stubble on my unshaven cheek. It wasn't heavy, and my biceps were more than willing to lift it. She lay neatly, her legs pressed tightly against my body, and I held them only with my left hand. At first, she acted stiffly. Then she relaxed and her breasts pressed against my back, skin to skin, white skin, womanly flesh against the tanned muscles of my torso. It was nice. I thought about using the kitchen table, but there was a bowl of fruit on it and a glass dish filled with chocolate brownies and another glass dish with cheeses. Also, I knew where there was another table that was bare, with thick, durable rattan legs and frame, and a glass top set into a rattan frame that was tempered with safety glass, it would more than hold it up. I carried her outside to the sidewalk, which at this time of day was shaded by two floors of the house, where there was a rattan table and matching rattan chairs, one of which had my shirt lying on it since the morning. Here they no doubt ate al fresco, perhaps with friends or with their extended family. I carefully lowered her, buttocks first, onto the glass tabletop, moved her back a little, then lowered her torso. She leaned her elbows on the glass to support her weight and not touch it with her back. It's cold, she said. The sun was blazing, but that wasn't what she had in mind. The hard glass would feel cold against the bare skin of her buttocks and back until her body warmed it. Lie on your back anyway. She did as she was told. She allowed me to guide her legs, bending each at the knee, bringing her feet close to each other, close to her buttocks, and then spreading her knees wide, a yoga pose, but on her back. Her hands now rested on both sides of the glass, and her back was pressed against the unyielding surface. The breasts continued to defy gravity. Instead of lying down, they formed twin mountains. Another woman might have used her hand to cover herself. She left herself open. Arms at her sides, palms on the glass, she just looked at me, those green eyes full of worry, but her body was passive, resigned, accepting her fate. Lie down, I told her. Maybe find some garden twine and use it to tie your wrists and ankles to the table legs. This could give things a very special kind of erotic twist. It might also have eased her conscience since being securely tied would have given her no choice and no responsibility. But I felt that was not necessary. Her limitations were mental, unquestioning submission, complete agreement. Her own will had given way, or perhaps her own deepest will had wanted it that way. In any case, she will remain where she was. I entered the kitchen again. Through two cabinets of shakers, I found an assortment of jams, marmalades, and honey. I chose honey and took a greenish banana from the fruit bowl because it was harder than the yellow ones. She didn't move an inch. I walked over and stood next to her, her knees still bent and spread. Only her chest moved, her breasts rising and falling with each breath. Her anxious eyes searched mine as I stood next to her, at the level of her chest. The banana stem snapped with slightly more force than would be required for a ripe fruit, the green skin splitting open to reveal the white flesh inside. I cleaned it completely while she watched. You do not, she said. I thought, I placed a banana on my lower belly. I unscrewed the cap from the honey, turned the flat bottle over it, and gently squeezed it. A thin trail of honey trailed down from the tip and down onto her chest, forming a worm-like spiral above her center. She gasped perhaps from the coolness of the thick liquid. I ran my hand over her body, and a trail of honey ran down the slope of her chest to the valley between them, then up the second peak, forming another spiral there. From this spiral, the trail descended onto the chest and wrapped around the navel. With my other hand, I removed the banana, and the trail of honey continued there, forming a final spiral. 
if stripping a non-resisting woman and laying her down naked, or even smearing her with honey, does not count as assault, then up to that point I had not done anything that constituted actual sexual assault of another man's wife, and although I had planned to have sex with that woman, I would hesitate to do anything unwanted. I wanted her to want it too. If you want me to stop doing what I'm doing, all you have to do is tell me, I said slowly and deliberately. I know, she answered. It was an answer that intrigued me. I meant what I said. I would have stopped any time, but her response gave me permission to continue and also told me that she trusted me. I bent over her breasts, bringing my mouth close to the spiral of honey. The honey tasted sweet. I lapped at it. My head bent over hers. My tongue felt the slight stickiness, the tug created by the honey, but also the smoothness of taut skin. I enjoyed it. I took my time, licking not only the obvious thick balls of sweetness, but also cleaning every trace of honey from my chest. She sobbed quietly every time she took a breath. One breast was licked clean. I licked the trail of honey that ran between the breasts, then licked the second spiral of honey, now more like a puddle, the lines of the spiral dissolving into each other. The tasty was just as sweet. She moaned, much more than just a moan. She shuddered. She gasped. She shook her head in disbelief. She began to buck, her ass lifted off the tabletop, her legs dangling. I placed my free hand on the concave flesh of her belly to at least keep that part as still as possible. She moaned. She screamed, alternating between long sobs, guttural moans, and piercing screams. The neighbors might have thought whatever they wanted when they heard her. I did not care. And at that moment, it seemed that she did too. Except she got too loud, and I'm generally an attentive guy. I assumed that her husband would find out in due time that I had taken full advantage of his wife, but their neighbors didn't need to know. I covered her mouth with my hand, and she fell silent. She twisted and squirmed and shuddered, but remained muted. She calmed down. I walked to the edge where her legs were no longer touching but dangling. They were spread. Her knees reached the edge of the table. Her shins hung vertically. I grabbed her legs and pulled her towards me. She half slid half squirmed, moving restlessly along the glass. I pressed her ass right up against the edge of the tabletop, her legs on either side of my waist. Big guy, compact woman. Do you want me to stop? Are you going to stop? She asked. Just three words, so meaningful. She was good. I mean, she read me well because earlier when she said she knew I would stop, she was right. Then I would do so. To stop now, to give up the pleasure, it was something else. It would be very difficult to stop now. It was a difficult question, so she was right to raise it the question of whether I would stop now that I was so close. Unfortunately, I knew that the answer, as difficult as it was, was that when push came to Chauvy, I didn't impose myself on anyone. I would stop, I said, unless you really want to. Her breasts rose and fell, and she looked at me with her green eyes. I was waiting. Don't stop. Just two words. Don't stop, was her last and final answer, or not so much an answer as an invitation or request, not strong enough to be a command or an instruction, but rather an expression of submission. With these two words, I immorally surrendered. Even when having sex with someone else's wife, you must maintain a sense of responsibility. I pulled the square foil package out of one of the many pockets of my shorts and was about to tear it open when she shook her head. You don't need this she said in a soft and gentle voice. I remembered the lack of any signs of children in the photographs or artwork in the kitchen and wondered if nature was cruel, but I accepted that she knew what she was telling me. I leaned forward. With one hand, I pulled her torso towards me. Then with the other hand, I reached behind her spine and pulled her even closer. Her elbows left the tabletop. Instinctively, she reached out to hug my neck. I squeezed the hand that was under her buttock, cupped the flesh, rested the back of my hand on the tabletop, and then lifted her up. She wrapped her legs around my waist, her breasts pressed against my chest. Her weight was now fully supported without the table. I stepped back, away from him. She gasped. 
My left bicep was tight and hard, taking most of her body weight because my left hand was under her butt. My other hand provided stability. Her legs and arms helped a little, but they were more cosmetic than truly supportive. Her head was turned to the side. Her hair and ear were touching my left shoulder. If revenge is sweet, then this was as sweet as it could be. Then I did something I had never done before with any woman. I removed my hands and let my arms hang on either side of her legs, which were tightly gripping my waist. My right hand was behind her back, more for stability than to support her weight. She wrapped her arms around my neck. Her legs were hugging me. Her ankles were locked together. The difference was that I removed my left hand. My strong thighs were good for a short walk, so we walked. That's what we did. I carried her through their garden. I wanted her to remember this every time she went outside. I wanted her to know that although she may be married to a rich guy, there is more to life than money and everything it can buy. She was one of the lucky ones. As I walked through their garden, across the lawn, between the flower beds, her body pressed against mine, she whimpered as I carried her through their open Eden, shuddering a little, squirming, gasping. She will remember this well. I enjoyed every minute of it, thinking about that day two years ago when I was invited into her husband's office and the grinning senior manager told me he'd have to break up with me. This was the guy I'd worked for for years, negotiating deals, for millions of dollars, but he sadly decided that I was no longer needed as part of cost-cutting, so I was duped. Now, through his wife, I took revenge on him. The thought was pleasant, but it turned out to be much more pleasant than I expected. I saw this guy's wife in a photo on his desk and knew she was pretty. Having sex with her and repaying the guy for dumping me was just a fantasy until he called me and asked if I would redo their garden since he knew I was now into gardening. It gave me an opportunity I didn't have before and I cornered it in their kitchen. Now this was happening, and later, I would be able to see his face when I told him that I not only had sex with his wife, but she asked me to do it. The thought was pleasant, but it was distracting. What was happening deserved my full attention. She deserved my full attention. So I closed the mental door, locked out thoughts about the guy himself, and focused on her. The ground under the apple tree was well watered, and the grass, cut short, was lush. I bent my knees all the way to the ground, then leaned forward. Her torso was now under me. Her legs were squeezing my waist. One of my hands was behind her. The other was palmed on the grass to take the weight of both our bodies. I lowered her with one hand and she pressed her back against the mown grass, and her butt touched the ground. Her legs loosened their grip, as did her arms. She lay flat, arms spread wide, legs spread. Screw what happened two years ago. Shitty revenge. It was pure and simple pleasure. It was beautiful, incredibly sexy sex. I was in heaven. Adam and Eve, under their apple tree in Eden, could not have enjoyed the gift of sex more than I did then. This is what happened in the shade of the apple tree, on the soft lawn, on that summer day. Afterwards, when the sensation subsided, and as soon as I pulled away, I lay down next to her and let her rest her head on my shoulder. I looked up through the branches of the tree. There were no apples yet to declare my sex, with her a sin. And I saw a clear blue sky shimmering between white flowers and green leaves. And Eden, for that moment, was recreated on earth. Ten, fifteen, maybe twenty minutes of quiet silence later, she looked up. Do you make love to all your clients' wives? Only if they have green eyes and if they let me undress them without asking permission. How many of them allowed you to do this? Only one so far. I'm glad. For some reason I was also happy. What about you? I asked. All the men who work here when your husband is not around make love to you? Only gardeners, she said. And only if they undress me without asking permission. So how many gardeners have done this? Only one. I was also glad about this, although it did not surprise me. We lay there a little longer. Then she said something, perhaps to calm me down, or perhaps saying it out loud help it or calm herself. I don't feel guilty, she said with gentle clarity. He deserved it. 
I assumed she meant her husband, which made me wonder what he might have done to her to make her say that. I decided not to ask. I didn't want to ruin this moment. Everything was too perfect. I didn't need her to explain. Thank you, he said. The garden looks really good. I think that's what we agreed on. He handed over a wad of cash. I prefer hard currency. I declare some income, but not all. I have seen firsthand how many guys make much more by doing much less and pay negligible taxes due to loopholes in the system. Not that I should complain, since I was once one of them. I rehearsed this moment. I had to take revenge. This was when I would tell him that I had sex with his wife. I even prepared a short speech. It's okay, I was about to say. Your wife has already paid me. She's a great lover. After you tricked me, I thought it would be only fair if I repaid you somehow, and she seemed only too happy. Just for the record, this has happened in this garden more than once. You can keep the cash. We are even. The truth was that I didn't need the cash. I had more than enough, and I had my own nice place. I worked in the garden because I liked working outdoors. It gave me a healthier lifestyle than an air-conditioned city office, and that paid several holidays abroad every year. Not only was the speech ready, but I could have said so much more. I spent most of the week there, and that first day wasn't the only one. On the second day, she made me coffee and brought it to me while I was working, wearing a different apron, light pink with lots of embroidered flowers, a belt around the waist, no bib to hide my chest. That was all she was wearing, and I didn't need a second invitation. This apple tree has seen more in a week than in all its years. I could have told him more, but instead I kept everything that happened to myself and took the cash. In the end, I took revenge on him, not by telling him what happened every summer day in his back garden, but simply by knowing how many times and how I had sex with his wife. I didn't need to cause her the trouble that would inevitably follow if I told him not only what happened, but how willing she was to do it. Her reasons for allowing our meetings to happen so often and with such zeal were hers and hers alone. That first time, she said he deserved it. I never asked her why. It remained between the two of them. Their relationship was their relationship that had to grow or end. But it wasn't up to me to tear it apart with the truth of what happened right under the apple tree in their garden. So I resolutely shut my mouth and took the cash. I said a few pleasantries and nothing more. Got in my truck and drove out the gate forever. Or so I thought. It was on Friday. I didn't have work on Saturday, and my revenge suddenly seemed less sweet. This guy cheated on me and I cheated on him, even if he didn't know. But I missed her. Not just because of the sex, but I missed her. Her green eyes, her smile as she came out with the coffee. Two mugs steaming, steam rising around her bare breasts. Her body next to mine after sex, her gentle breath. She got to me. You learn to live without what you cannot have. There are other women and you get your share from them, even if something inside is still missing. Until I received her call a year later, I swiped the green answer icon on my phone screen. Hello, I said, trying to sound casual and friendly. At first I only heard quiet breathing. Then she spoke. I need a gardener, she said, her voice as warm and soft as always. This voice awakened sweet memories, my dear. I remembered our every day under the apple tree and how she lay well-fed, next to me, and how good I felt in those moments. Okay, I said. What do you need to do? You planted something last year. It's all very beautiful, but it needs attention. And I was wondering if you could bring some more of the same seeds you gave last time and plant them too. She chose her words more carefully than I realized, as I realized later. My first thought was that I didn't really need the job, but it would be nice to see her again. Maybe, just maybe, I'll be able to make love to her again. That's how I thought about it. Making love, not sex. Although making love can be just as passionate, just as powerful, just as intense, just as all-consuming. But I played it cool. She wanted me to plant something. That was all she said. I accepted the job and said I would call in two days. Only then did I think more deeply about what she said. Last year I did not bring any seeds with me and did not plant them in her flower beds. The electronic gate opened for my truck. I went inside. 
She came out to greet me. It was nice to see her, too nice. We can have coffee in the garden, she suggested. I can tell you what I'm thinking. We walked around the house. She left me at the same rattan table, and I made myself comfortable in one of the chairs, waiting for coffee. When she came out again, she was holding a tray with more than just two coffee mugs. I think she had a sense of humor. I thought you might want something to eat, she said. Is banana cake okay? Along with the coffee were two plates, each holding a piece of dark brown cake, each piece glistening with a smooth amber layer. I knew, even before I tasted it, that the shiny amber shell was honey. But she expressed her intentions even more clearly than those pieces of cake and honey. She was still wearing the apron, but the skirt and blouse were gone, and the apron was tied around her again. I played it cool again. I looked around at the flower beds scattered across the lawn. Just like you said on the phone, everything I planted for you seems to have gone well. That's true, she agreed. Although there is something else you planted, her green eyes sparkled mischievously as she returned to the kitchen instead of joining me. This gave me a great view of her naked back, butt, and legs. I was filled with anticipation. I also felt uneasy, a strange feeling in my stomach. There's something else you planted. She came outside again, carrying a bundle wrapped in a knitted white blanket. And even as she approached me, my chest tightened with the knowledge that it was something else. And one of the several million long-tailed seeds I had planted on the right depth within this woman had definitely risen and grown within her until it was ready to emerge and face the world, protected by her love. Do you mind if I feed him while we talk? She asked, sitting down. Of course, I didn't mind. She reached over and untied the harness. She lowered the bib of her apron and moved the bundle to press the baby's head against her right breast, leaving her left breast bare for me to admire. A tiny hand emerged from the folds of the blanket. Then I heard gentle sucking sounds. My? I ventured to ask. My husband had a vasectomy a few months after we got married. That was all the answer I needed. Her tone was pleasant factual without a hint of accusation or regret or complaint against me. It was my child, but it was her child, and she didn't ask anything from me, or so it seemed. I said nothing, taking in what she told me. There was the strange timing of her husband's vasectomy to be processed, just a few months after they got married. I always wanted children, she continued. He had two, with his previous wife, he promised that we could try as soon as we got married. I believed him, and again, I didn't say anything. I was not the only person he deceived then, and what he did to me was mild compared to breaking such obligations towards his wife. I thought, she said now more hesitantly, when you did it to me, with honey, I mean, and then you suggested using protection, well, I thought that, this is a chance, and he deserves it. That's when I remembered what she said, as we lay together after I filled her with my cum under the apple tree, that he deserved it. He deprived her of the opportunity to have children. She decided to take a chance with someone else, with me. Revenge is sweet. How did he take it? I asked, wondering what the true motive was. The desire to have a child, or her desire to take revenge on a husband, who had reneged on a promise, and not just any promise, but one central to her sense of being and their relationship. I filed for divorce, she said, before he found out that I was expecting a child. Just before you came to work in our garden, I found out that he was having sex with someone in his office. He deserves it. Her words, spoken a year ago under the apple tree, were not just about the vasectomy, because he cheated on her too. He really was a bastard. So now it's just you and... I named him Reggie. Do you like it? It's a good name. I wanted something strong, like his father. And now, maybe a brother or a sister, if you don't mind, she answered. I thought about what she was telling me and what I was seeing right before my eyes. I suddenly became the father of a little boy who was suckling his mother's breast just a few feet away from me. Likewise, there was something incredibly sexy about the way she sat, 
casually feeding her son, our son, her bare breasts. A year ago, she accepted a little pleasure. Pain when I bit her nipple with my teeth. She deserved better. Pleasure is a different kind of pain, the kind that leaves marks on your ass. A stallion for hire? Something like that, she grinned. I thought that the way she had acted, using me to get pregnant without saying anything until now, three months after the baby was born, and then presenting me with a fait accompli with no return, deserved at least a little punishment. Under the apple tree? It worked before. We waited until the baby was fed and put to bed in the shade on the patio. But first I used my palm, both white buttocks. At least they were white when I started. They turned a nice shade of red. You must was to me. Say, five words. The sound of a strong hand slapping soft flesh came after each word. Right, left, right, left, right again. Pause. I'm very sorry, she said. If she wanted a brother or sister for our son, then I hope she got one. It was more years ago than I care to remember. It's hard to say what exactly brought us together forever. Having sex with her again was incredible. Sex brings people together. It's the same with children, and we only have three of them, and that's still the case, except they don't think they're kids anymore. The apple tree turned out to be a not-so-sinful place to end a growing relationship. Sometimes when people get close, they sell their old houses and buy a whole new place so there won't be any previous memories. But we decided we really liked the apple tree. And so I sold my house and moved in with her, and a few months later the wedding bells rang for us. Having a family also limits your style. Making love under a tree is not entirely appropriate in a family home while children are growing up. There were times when they were all at school or with grandparents, but not as often as we would like. However, sex in bed with Egyptian cotton sheets can also be quite good. But last autumn, our youngest daughter left to start her three-year course at university. So now my wife and I enjoy the house alone and use the garden as we please. I take care of the flower beds and mow the lawn. My loving wife buys honey. Every now and then... She even comes back from the store and fills our vase with pink apples, bright oranges, and nice firm green bananas. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.